again, this goes back to the conversation about how we need to reestablish the purpose of news is for a democracy that we really think about why we're reading the news um, in the first place. If you're reading the news because you want to be more informed and help your democracy, let's do it the right way. If you're simply looking at the headline because you want to share it, then you're more like you're better um, described as a fake news disseminator. So I think you need to make a decision about what you want to be and what you want to do. Welcome to Endless Coffee Cup, a regular discussion of marketing news, culture, and media for our complex digital lifestyle. Join Matt Bailey as he engages in conversation to find insights beyond the latest headlines and deeper understanding for those involved in marketing. Grab a cup of coffee, have a seat, and thanks for joining. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me again on the Endless Coffee Cup podcast. And I'm really excited about today because if you've listened to any of the previous podcasts, you'll know that digital literacy is something that I'm very passionate about. And so when I was contacted uh, about a new book on the market and the potential of interviewing the author, Nolan Higdon, uh, his book is The Anatomy of Fake News. And Nolan, looking at your background, this is not something that's new to you. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I've been studying, um, you know, f fake news or f false or misleading news content um, for about a, a decade now, and um, that was kind of the, the weird, um, the weird space I found myself in during the uh, 2016 election. On the one hand, I knew um, Donald Trump was weaponizing the phrase "fake news" for his own purposes, but on the other hand, he was. Uh, making it popular to talk about something I've been studying for 10 years. So I was simultaneously dismayed yet excited for the opportunity to, to talk about fake news. I could see that. And, and that's one thing about your book that I really enjoyed was that you went back into history and showed that this is not anything new. It, it has its roots. I, I think you went back a thousand years, uh, I think, in history, um, looking at some of the earliest documentation that we have. Uh, you know, it fascinated me, you know, just to go back to Christopher Columbus and how he reported what he saw and how it wasn't the truth. And so it's been with us. Yeah, and I want to give, um, you know, I thought it was important for that historical context because there was so much conversation focused on um, the internet and Russians and Donald Trump. And, I, you know, I wanted to point out that if you really want to address this problem, you need to understand it has a much longer history and there are way more actors and players than that short list. And so we have to understand who's behind the problem and what the problem is before we can actually address it. Absolutely. And that's where your premise of the book, I think, is straightforward. You repeat it a few times, but the only effective means of combating fake news are critical thinking skills. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm. You know, a lot of uh, well-meaning people in industry and in government um, and elsewhere are trying to come up with solutions to combat fake news, and I go through those solutions, um, but a lot of them don't really understand the, the problem of fake news and then they tend to exacerbate the problem. And then some of the very people who are uh, being asked to solve this problem are actually either profiting uh, politically or economically from the production dissemination of fake news, which makes their whole approach kind of questionable. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That And being so my background is in journalism and then I ended up in marketing. And so watching the evolution of journalism from a primarily, you know, television, magazine, radio to now internet where they can monetize a page rather than selling advertising that supports the business that has transformed journalism so that now we can, if we have a story, as you say, as it goes viral or a story that gets a lot of page views that story creates more revenue. And so automatically there's a question of, well, what are we trying to satisfy here? Are we trying to satisfy corporate stakeholders or are we trying to create an accurate representation of the news? And so right away, you've got an immediate ethics problem. Absolutely. Uh, and you know that's a, a sort of a central premise of the book is that there's a lot of great journalists out there who mean what, uh, have good intentions and, and want to do the job of journalism in a democracy. 
But um, there's a lot of incentives to get them to report kind of trivial BS very quickly um, to keep their employment. And, you know, I always tell my students, I teach journalism as well, that, um, you know, a lot of those more wonky stories are way more important to people's lives, but they're sort of difficult to report on and they're difficult to understand. Um, so you have to kind of make the time to, to simplify and explain where I think a lot of journalists are just ignoring those stories and saying, let's cover Donald Trump's tweet and how, um, you know, offensive it is and to which groups it's offensive to. Let's talk about that for 24 hours. And that, you know, that may be great once at every blue moon, but when it's every single day, um, it doesn't really do anything in terms of kitchen table issues and things like that. Well, you bring up a good point, and it doesn't really take much research to see that Donald Trump has been good for business beyond anything else. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny when you, I guess we ask people questions, what they'll say, but um, Les Moonves of CBS has more or less noted this. Jeff Zucker um, noted, uh, noted it from CNN. And they said that, yeah, the Trump years have been pretty good for, for ratings. A lot of people in media positioning themselves as so-called resistance has been good for ratings. Um, my concern is not necessarily the political implications uh, in the book, but people aren't getting news in that process. Uh, they, they sort of set up this, um, you know, world wrestling uh, entertainment mentality. And this is, there's a guy named Eric, <laughs> Bisho Eric Bischoff who used to work in yes, world championship yes. wrestling. And he, he said this years ago, he said, when I watch the news, they're doing what I used to do in wrestling, that they're creating good guys and bad guys and storylines that keep you hooked and tuned in, but none of it's real. It's, it's all sort of just infotainment. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, I grew up watching a lot of that. So it makes so much sense. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I gotta tell you, I do, I do so many of these, um, these podcast interviews and um, I use Bischoff's analogy there and I find there's so many of us uh, former wrestling fans out there in the media <laughs> world. So that's good. Good to know. <laughs> It is. It's, it's, you know, it's one of those things that it just stays with you for life. I mean, I, and yeah. Okay. We could talk about that all day, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I, and you know, this, we kind of cover that with Trump and it's like an everyday thing. I mean, it really wears people down. I mean, especially now when you've got, uh, you know, wildfires, you've got the election, you've got COVID. I think, and, and maybe you've experienced this well, people are just emotionally drained, but yet they can't stop paying attention to the news or articles or things that show up in their social streams. Yeah, um, and we're seeing, you know, this, these levels of um, despair and, and people just taking intellectual shortcuts because they're, they're so exhausted. Um, now it's basically if Trump's, you know, if you're a Democrat and Trump's for it, you're against it. And if you're a Trump supporter, he says it, but it must be true. Um, and people are really sort of digging deeper, thinking deeper when it comes to a lot of these issues. And I think that has much to do with our hyper partisan um, culture as much as it does with people just being simply exhausted um, from the last uh, four years, for sure. Well, what is it about fake news that makes it, I guess, so easy to fall for it. Yeah, I mean, you know, traditionally fake news is usually um, constructed in a way that's meant to elicit some sort of response. Um, so you brought up even like Columbus's reaction. Columbus was trying to elicit a response from the monarchy that he had found this new world and found all this wealth and that he should be recognized as a hero in that sense. But What's, that's sort of been the traditional way. And we've had governments who've done this. Uh, members of news media, quite frankly, have done this. It's been individuals like uh, Jason Blair or bigger media narratives like the drive up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, the, the big game changer, though, was the Internet. The Internet was a game changer, in my opinion, of fake news. I was trying to stay away from assuming that we're living in a historical time because I feel like every generation does that. But I, I do think the evidence is there to say that the Internet was a major game changer in the way that we uh, take in information. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and now we're, um, you know, not just encountering fake news like we always have throughout history, but it's customized in a way with um, algorithmic insights to our behaviors, our attitudes, and it's customized in a way to elicit a response from us as an individual. And that's a much more um, powerful tool because before the fake news producers kind of had to guess um, you know, what you would respond to and what you wouldn't. Now in the internet age, they have a lot of data to inform that decision that simply didn't exist in previous generations. Absolutely. That's 
a lot of the conversations I have with people who I, I would say are kind of on the outside of this, like we'll bring up Cambridge Analytica. And when I tell them that, do you do realize that Cambridge Analytica didn't change anyone's vote? All they did was reinforce the people who already had strong opinions and then leverage off of them to reach others. And and they're surprised by that because they, for some reason, the narrative that they've accepted is that people were brainwashed or uh, they changed their vote or they changed their mind about something rather than, as you said, algorithmically, they already knew where you were. They just reinforced those attitudes. Yeah, and this is a, um, you know, this this may change in 2020, what I'm about to say, but at least as far as 2016 is concerned. Um, all of the uh, evidence we have, and this isn't just my research, but Bankler and other people have done this as well. Um, television news was more influential in shaping people's electoral decisions than the internet in 2016. Um, now, uh, that could change in 2020 because millennials will be the biggest part of the voting block in 2020, and, and they tend to use internet news more than television news. But um, I think what happened was old, so-called old or traditional media, like broadcast media, they're watching their viewership go down, um, they're getting less ratings, and they kind of blamed everything on the internet as a fix-all. And I think that's why you hear that narrative so much that everyone assumes the internet was behind the 2016 election outcome. Um, but I, I think it's a little more complicated than that. Um, and as you point out with Cambridge Analytica, if they know your behaviors and attitudes, what they can do is um, radicalize you or ramp you up so much that then you do vote for people who maybe otherwise wouldn't have voted. Um, and this is what Facebook reports it did in, in 2018, right? It said that um, it changed its algorithms and it feels confident that it uh, ended up having more people vote than would have not voted without their efforts, um, which, which sounds maybe sounds like a good thing, more people voting, but... But At first, they, it does, yeah. Right, right yeah, but a, a company, you know, kind of having the influence of whether or not someone does or doesn't vote is pretty scary, in my opinion. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and as you pointed out in the book, there is this mentality among, you know, especially Facebook, but some of these techno companies, that there's a devaluation of education and a priority of technology. And, and I thought that was very interesting in how you separated those attitudes and how that then shows how Facebook makes their decisions, that they believe technology is the answer and they can do everything with an algorithm. Yeah, it's, a, it's you know, one of the sort of strangest uh, kind of conversations we see happening nationally. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg has sort of positioned himself as the savior of democracy and the captain of socializing. Um, and it's not really clear what skills or perspectives he has to, to do that, um, nor has he shown any demonstration that he's actually strengthened democracy or our uh, communication skills. In fact, if you look around in 2020 in the United States of America, even withholding the um, pandemic and lockdown, um, <laughs> there seems to be much less communication um, and politics seems to be at the worst. I mean, the, the polls are showing right now that regardless of who's who you're voting for, your decision is based more likely on who you're voting against rather than what you're voting for. And uh, that's not a good sign in a democracy. No, not at all. I, I Yeah, this is what the second election where both candidates have below, uh, you know, negative approval rating <laughs> and <laughs> uh, below 50 percent approval. And uh, yeah. And one thing that I, I noticed so much is it, it's more conversation in memes rather than actual data and information, it's almost like a meme fight that's going on. And you really have to put up this gauntlet of, you know, protection in order not to fall into these these meme battles that are going on. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, one of the, the things that, um, you know, really concerns me, and I'm working on a, a separate project on this right now, is that we've become really comfortable in just assuming that the quote unquote other side is unreachable or not worth our time. So we throw like these, these meme insults at them. Um, but we never really try and engage with them or meet people where they're at. We just assume they're like lost, like 50% of the population is lost forever. Um, that's pretty dangerous. You know, in a democracy, we have to have communication and we can agree to disagree, but we, we can't just sort of put people in boxes and pretend like they're beyond the pale. Oh, absolutely. I, 
you know, and there's words that are used by each side. And you make a great point of this in the book that when you start using words to describe them, all, you're dehumanizing that. You're dehumanizing the group. You're dehumanizing their opinion. And that plays into fake news. Yeah. Uh, one of the main themes I found as I look through this history of fake news um, was that a lot of fake news is aimed at dehumanizing individuals and groups. And, um, you know, there's a long history of this against uh, Native Americans and African Americans and, and even um, women as well um, that I found throughout uh, the history of fake news. And that's why I think in our, our political discourse, uh, we should be cautious when we see content that dehumanizes anyone, even our, our worst enemy. Um, we should recognize that if you allow anybody to be dehumanized, you open up the gates for everyone to be dehumanized. Um, and so it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, you know, it's tough for me to think that, um, you know, like I could love Donald Trump, but I, but I try to love him as a person, not as a, not as an actor or anything <laughs> like that, but as a human being, right. Um, I try and find that human being in him. Um, and I, I think that that's a, a strong step we could all sort of take, um, that fake news really tries to get us to do the opposite of fake news tries to get us to, to see, whole swaths of people as inhuman and then it justifies doing anything to them because they're not humans now then they're objects right and, and nobody cries with, with on an object if i drop a, a pen on the ground nobody's going to cry so you start seeing these humans as an, an object and it makes it easier to do things like go to war commit genocide death camps i mean these are the the outcomes of fake news that dehumanizes groups oh absolutely and, and that's you know but also i look at uh you know, even just in your own neighborhood, uh, you know, using the words libtard or fascist, it, it, you know, you do that online, maybe not even knowing your neighbor could fall into that group. And now you've dehumanized them to the point where, and, and we've seen this as well, where people can justify violence because they believe they're protecting themselves or protecting society, uh, you know, and just I, I, that's one thing I've been training my my kids is you see any of these trigger words immediately, you know, someone's got an agenda and they're trying to get you emotionally involved. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, those, you know, emotions tend to be reactive. So if you have um, content or as you point out, words like that, that, that can um, draw out those emotions and you can get folks to do things they, they otherwise wouldn't do. And, um, you know, even, even words like um, fascism, you know, it, researched fascism for a lot and i i don't think it's an ideology that has disappeared but we should be cautious because we don't want to overuse that word we want to make sure we use it when it's needed and don't <laughs> overuse it before it is you know so those, those kinds of things i think are, are things that could serve um democracies well and you know part of the way that fascist regimes have survived historically is they've been able to dehumanize some group um and so just it, like you said it starts through language um, but then it gets into practice and all of a sudden, otherwise rational people are legitimizing violence and murder against groups. Oh, absolutely. What even and, and you make a great point when you were talking about uh, you, you pointed to a study of middle schoolers where less than one fifth can distinguish news from sponsored, which I, I, I look at that. I'm like, well, it's not just middle schoolers. I, <laughs> I'm seeing huge swaths of the population that cannot distinguish news from the sponsored uh, bait at the bottom of the page, uh, but also less than a third can identify implicit bias. And you know, I've got teenage kids, and one of my young teenage daughters uh, was reading an article, and she was angry for about two days. And finally, she let me, you know, she let me in on it and she had read an article and it was about abortion and she was so infuriated that she did not even, she didn't want to talk. She didn't want to deal with things. And we finally sat down and looked at the article and I pointed out, look at the language that they're using to describe their opponents. Look at uh, the emotion that you're feeling because of these words. And I tell you what, that was probably one of the most helpful experiences in our communication together, but also now she's reading things differently. She also came to me about a month ago and she wants to learn rhetoric because they're not going to teach it in school. So she wants to learn those things. Um, but 
wow, what a story can do just through the words that it uses to dehumanize opposition, but then also emotionally manipulate us rather than give us facts. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, uh, your, your story there about um, your, your daughter kind of um, strikes at a larger case I'm trying to make in the, in the book, which is that we, we really need to treat um, the studying of news as central to our education system. And the reason why is because we do want to live in a democracy. And I think in the last 40 years, we've kind of convinced ourselves that we're a capitalist nation and that everything, all tools need to be to serve capitalism. And there's a debate there to be had, but I always look at the United States as being defined more about democracy. And I think we should centralize democracy over anything else, including in our, our education system. Um, and what that means is, you know, teaching students that, look, we need a free press. Like there's a lot of journalists who I have distaste for, but we need a free press. It's, it's the uh, main pillar of a democracy. And we also need a citizenry that's capable of deconstructing news contents, uh, just like you described doing with your daughter there. You know, what are the words using? What evidence is here? What's this person's agenda? Who is the author? Who is the publisher? Um, how does that influence what is and isn't reported? Um, democracy, you know, is, is a work 20 is work 24 hours a day. And, and news is a major part of that. But we really haven't um, treated it like that in our education system at all. You know, we, we focused on quote unquote, marketable skills, uh, but we focus very little on civics. Only about a fifth of our high schools in this country mandate some sort of civics course uh, for graduation. And, and even in those, there's no evidence that they necessarily centralize news literacy skills. <laughs> no. Well, and that's the thing. It, it goes far beyond civics. Uh, you know, as I was preparing here and reading through this, I, I was telling my wife, look, this this is more important than math and physics. And, uh, you know, this is part of social studies. This is – there anyone who learns media literacy is going to use this every day for the rest of their life. And it's not just what they see on the internet. It's how they process any information they receive through any media. And that is a daily chore that will enhance your career no matter what. And so I see it as, you know, I would call it like the gen ed that we have to understand this because you're going to, it will improve your other skills and your other marketable skills, but they're absolutely, I agree with you. There absolutely has to be a basis of critical thinking and evaluation of any type of media. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's always fun to kind of, um, for, for some people, I guess, to, to pick on younger people, but, um, Look at you know what happened, and then we drop this media information bomb upon them in the form of the internet and social media, and we didn't put anything in our schools to give them the skills to to sift through it responsibly. And so <laughs> I, I think I think keeping that in mind when we approach these topics with young people is really important that they're in a space that that is unfamiliar to anybody, and this has never been happened before in, in human history. Um, so I think we have an obligation. I, I also think though that um, and you point out about the necessity of media literacy. I, I obviously agree. Um, I think we need to do a better job of explaining what media literacy is. I think uh, some folks have the idea like, oh, those are the people that get together and make movies or draw posters. You know, we need to show that it's, it's much deeper. It's about analyzing and deconstructing. And we're, we're dealing with media already somewhere between 10 to 16 hours a day. Um, so let's make sure we, we give folks uh, the skills and perspectives to do it responsibly. Absolutely. And I think this is part of the the technological, I, I would say, effects on society is like what you explained, all of a sudden it's been dropped in our lap with no instruction manual. And I equate that to what teachers are going through right now. So many of them now have to use these online classroom tools, and they're just expected to use them without being taught how to use them in the same way we give our students laptops, but we're not teaching them how to use them, how to protect themselves. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it, it seems to be a trend with technology that we're telling people here it is, but not explaining how to use it properly. Yeah. Because the, the devil's in the details, you know, a lot of the folks in industry and this dates back for pre Silicon Valley, but definitely in Silicon Valley are, um, they they really want to be the ones to teach you how to use their content. 
Um, and they don't want uh, more like critical educators who not only show you how to use it, but also how to, how to ask questions, um, you know, like, do I want to be notified all the time? Do I want to be addicted to email? Do I want my data collected? <laughs> you know, yada, yada, right? Um, so there, there's kind of a fight in that sense that um, industry doesn't really want a lot of this education. Um, they'll, you know, donate money to, to make it look like good PR, but really what they're donating money to is teach you how to use Facebook, not how to question Facebook. Right. And that I that was a great uh, part of your book where you talked about the the techno utopian approach. And absolutely, you know, we see the brands that are involved in education, but what are they truly doing? And, and I, I guess I, I would say they're teaching people how to be better consumers of the product, but not learning how to use the product. Yeah, um, that's that's basically the goal. This is, you know, companies like um, Sony, Facebook, Google, um, they, they've they really led the way on this. Uh, there was this was attempted in the middle of the 20th century as well. Um, but, you know, a lot of teachers get sort of um, swept up in it because they're like you said, they're in new spaces. They're desperate for content that's relevant. And in walks Google with like a slick handbook that you can use. And you can hand out assignments to your students and they're on their screens and loving it. Um, but you know, what's more important for that content is what's missing. Um, you know, what questions are you, are you not asking? And, and I think you saw this uh, after 2016. There were all those hearings about uh, the role of the internet played in, in the election. And the Congress people really seemed stupefied as to how Silicon Valley makes its money or yes. the connection <laughs> between data collection and fake news. And, and um, so they basically said, okay, you guys can regulate yourself. And it's not even necessarily that I think Silicon Valley is evil and, and, and won't regulate itself. You're simply asking them to do something they can't do. How is Silicon Valley going to decipher out um, truth from falsehood in every single situation? It's impossible. That's never going to happen. Um, we're, we're, I think we're better positioned if we have critical thinking citizenry that can analyze and make these decisions for themselves rather than just throwing more tech at a problem that is largely exacerbated by tech. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and your other option was more government regulation to the point of censorship. And you brought up the hearings. And to me, if the hearings showed me one thing, it's that the government doesn't understand tech. And those hearings were almost embarrassing because of the lack of understanding shown by our leadership about tech, how it operates, how they make money, uh, how any of these algorithms work. And so how are they supposed to come up with any regulation? But I, I love how in the book, how you you also show that regulation, that's not really the right answer either. Yeah, re I mean, regulation can make some things better. Like I think, um, you know, the Telecommunications Act created more diverse ownership, which I think was good. The Fairness Doctrine created a little more diverse discourse, which was good. But we, we can't harp back for the good old days. I mean, you can look back at like the Vietnam War. That was in the era of regulated media and our media system uh, lied to the public and maintained this lie for, for years. So regulation can do some things and then, well, but not everything. And then regulation can go way too far um, and, and commit things like censorship, um, which ironically we sort of have anyways, we have censorship by proxy with these, these companies and the government itself is in this big fake news war against other countries like Russia and China. So they have an incentive to privilege their own fake news over these other countries. And we can't forget that, but they're an active player in uh, the fake news problem. Absolutely. I was amazed to see, uh, even especially I think when uh, first few months of COVID and the mask regulations where we started to see protests against the lockdowns, uh, and it came out very quickly that these are not grassroots protests. They're structured. They're organized. Uh, the dom the domain names or the the Facebook groups are being are they're centralized, and you know that I that didn't make the news as much as the protest did. And again, it, it's one of those frustrating things where people are just running along with the news rather than taking that moment or two to to think seriously about it. Yeah, I really want to drill down on what you're saying there, because I, I think this is uh, one of the most important things, and it, it's also one of the most confusing things, that it generally the best fake news either takes something that's true and brings it in a direction that's false, 
or it uh, exploits actual feelings. And so like that protest, a lot of the folks at that protest, you know, I think we're responding to the fact the government bailed out Wall Street and corporations, but didn't bail out the working class. Yet these people are being told they can't work and their economy is, is failing. So you have this legitimate economic anxiety and anger. And then fake news drives in and says, hey, you know, what you, you know how you could resolve this is going against these people who are asking you to put on masks. <laughs> They're the real problem, right? And so you drive, you drive that energy. And, and it's similar to what um, you know, Trump did in the 2016 campaign. There was legitimate economic anxiety and anger in middle America. Um, I know some of my friends on the coast don't like to admit it, but he took that and he said, look, blame the immigrants, blame the coasts. And he, he took it at these other forces um, and so that's kind of the, the real power of fake news when you can take something that's real feeling or a real story and then exploit it for your own purposes. That is the key. I mean, like you said, there was a legit, there is legitimate emotion. There's a legitimate frustration. And what fake news is doing is channeling it to a, to an end. Uh, and, and there doesn't seem to be, you know, when we have these other worldwide actors, the end may not make sense. The end is more just to create more chaos. Yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, it, sometimes you want to see uh, chaos because in chaos, certain groups or individuals can can thrive. Um, and I think, you know, Steve Bannon, uh, who worked on the Trump campaign and administration briefly, he, he talked about this, that the way you centralize power uh, for the right is by creating so much chaos that the left gets so angry, they're focused on so many things at once, they can't do anything. And that was his that was his plan with Trump coming in. Uh, you know, Bannon, for all of his faults, he uh, honestly tells you his game plan, which I think is fascinating. Um, right. <laughs> so so he so he admitted this. Right. And if you go back and you look at that time period, you can see Trump was just making random announcements every day. Right. There's going to be a there's going to be a Muslim ban. He was going to ban LGBTQ folks from the military. He was going to release the JFK documents. And you just say all these things. And, you know, it all at some level acts as a distraction from what he really wants to do, you know, which is create like this um, tax reduction plan and, and put some judges in place and remove some people at the head of different departments, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, you know, it, it's the magician's trick. It, it's, it's, I'm waving my hand over here to get your attention. Then in over here, uh, you know, I'm passing the biggest surveillance bill. Uh, bipartisan, in fact, uh, you know, and that's, you know, things like that. And, and you know, speaking of surveillance, exp- I, I love it. Explain surveillance capitalism and how it falls into fake news. Yeah, sir, uh, surveillance capitalism goes back to this this idea that, uh, you know, for, gosh, most of our capitalist history, advertisers have tried to get your attention. That's how they make money. They get your attention and they convince you to, to buy something. Um, well, these... Uh, Silicon Valley, when the internet really sort of launched, it didn't know how it was going to make money. It was kind of playing with ads and it was kind of taking some data, but not a lot. But after the uh, dot-com bubble of 2000, a lot of these companies failed. Uh, remember, like Pets.com lost like 70% of its revenue and things like this. So, so um, the companies that were left, you know, Google with search engines, Amazon, which was primarily selling books, um, they had this data and they realized there was a market out there um, for data that was analyzed in these algorithms. And this became surveillance capitalism. Can we collect as much data as possible and then analyze it through algorithms and then sell those findings um, to advertisers? And in the sense, the advertiser comes to the company and says, you know, we want to target this group or we want to sell this. And you give them space or access to the people that your algorithm have determined are most likely to, to buy the content. Um, so that's surveillance capital. It's all the microphones. It's all the cameras. It's every click. It's every like. It's every search. It's your GPS. Um, it's in your car. It's in your television. It's in your Alexa. It's in your laptop. And um, you're, you're being surveilled constantly in an effort to collect data. And what uh, Shoshana Zuboff uh, talks about, in, um, she says that, We've these algorithms have gone from predicting your behavior, i.e., if I show them this ad, I predict they'll buy this product, to um, nudging your behavior. That is, well, if we put them in this proper setting, we can then put a buy now button in front of them and they're likely to buy now. And so they're now trying to actually um, control human behavior rather than just predict it. Um, and if 
And if you go back to like really early Silicon Valley and in in with Lid Letter in the 50s and 60s, he was this kind of like philosophical guru of Silicon Valley. And he, he coming from Stanford said, look, the, the big goal that Stanford and these other universities want to do is we want to replace the human brain with a machine brain because machines, in his opinion, uh, were less likely to, to fall to emotion and things like that. And so in some ways, Silicon Valley is trying to live out Lidletter's um, fantasy, which is let's replace uh, human thinking and human behavior with machines and, and algorithms. And that's kind of the, the basis of surveillance capitalism for fake news producers. That means that you can use those algorithms to determine how people will react to your fake news content. And, um, you know, Trump famously spent, uh, um, you know, millions of dollars on um, Facebook in 2016, as have um, other nations as well, to figure out how to use these algorithms to convince people to do things they might otherwise not do. Yeah, and this gets into you know my area of marketing and the sheer amount of data that is collected on people. Uh, in in any of my trainings, I usually will start out by having people go to the Google My Activity where they see the history of their searches, their video views. If they're on a Android phone, they'll see all of their app activity as well. And, and more than half of the class is shocked just at that amount of data being recorded and visible. And I'm trying to explain to them that, okay, this is just what you see. This, and, and they're shaken by it. And it, some of them are immediately like, stop tracking me. I'm like, it's not good enough. Uh, people in general don't have a clue about what's being tracked. And I think they've fallen also for the narrative of, if I give my data, I get better ads, which to me is a complete fake narrative <laughs> of exchange of value. Uh, so this is, it's just amazing to me how many people have no conception at all of the data, uh, or they just feel like giving up because there's no way I could stop it. A have you seen how that plays into some of the attitudes about the fake news as well? Yeah. So, you know, two, two things on that. One of them I want to emphasize that you, you said, I think is, is right on that Silicon Valley has convinced people that this data collection is making your online experience better. Um, but to, to be frank, we find that people tend to click on things and like things that either anger them really or that they agree with so um google you know is more likely to give you search results that confirm your view when in fact you might need actual evidence to, to the contrary because you might be wrong um, instead we're reinforcing people's views and the divisive content um is a lot more popular as well because it appeals to our emotions so we get we engage with the idea of hating the other person on the other side of the screen but we don't engage with, like loving the other person on the other side of the screen too often so i think i think that's key and then your other your other question about did people make this connection to fake news um no when i when i was early writing this book i was giving speeches around the country and uh, i treated silicon valley as you know an equal part of my book as anything else and um, people just had no clue. They, they thought that the whole talk should be just about, about that. And so you're right that the folks don't know. Um, I also you know, teach students and, and students, they come in pretty um, apprehensive to the idea that their data is being collected in this way and being used for anything but, but good. But after you kind of um, go through them with you know, 15, 16 weeks, you have quite a number of students who come back and say, you know, I decide to get rid of my social media or I decide I'm going to turn off all my apps and notifications and only turn them on when I want to use them rather than that, rather than them notify me when I should use them. And so you do start to see those changes, but it takes, it takes a lot of work. Um, you know, it's, it's not a joke to say that these things are addicting. Um, they, they've used a lot of the same methodologies that were used by the gambling industry that you um, start to do the same thing over and over again, because you want that dopamine rush that you got the one time you want on a slot machine. Well, the same thing happens that one time you got a friend who liked you or that one time you got a notification, you keep coming back and back and back. Um, but we're spending endless time. And if the, if the psychological studies were showing that we were happier and better off, then let's do it. But they're showing just the opposite. Um, we're showing dramatic increases in self mutilation amongst young people and suicide attempts amongst young people. Um, we're seeing a drop in like uh, romantic relationships and um, sex in young people. 
And, you know, these are all signs of a, of a sort of generation in, in despair that it's just sort of stuck there staring at its screen, waiting for happiness to arrive. Wow. I mean, that <laughs> those last few sentences are heavy. I mean, a generation in despair. I mean, it really, I, you know, once in a while, I'll peruse Reddit just to kind of catch a few things. And that perfectly sums up the attitude that you see there. And it's expressed in numerous ways, but the loneliness, the really the, the pointlessness of life is reflected in so much of what's posted there. And if that's your main source of information if, and, and also being reinforced by people all over the world, you, you know, in, in your age group, uh, it really does drive this sense of hopelessness. And, you know, I, 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 got to put that into the fake category as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we, we used to debate this language in um, academia, you know, are, are you a media user or a media consumer? And we wanted you to be a media user, like you use the tools. You know, what we're, what we're starting to, I think, really realize is um, these new digital tools are really using us. They notify us when we should pick them up, when we should look at them, when we should respond. Um, and it, it's almost like the, the tool has become the master and the master has become the tool in that sense. And I, I don't think um, it's necessarily all, all doom and gloom. Um, it, it goes back to something you said earlier. There's a lot of people just don't know. I mean, knowledge, knowledge is power. When, when I do talk to parents or I do talk to young people, you know, they, they take an interest and I, I give them things that they can do. And then it's ultimately up to them. I don't tell anyone what they should do, but you know, I do say, you know, consider like, do you really need social media? Do you need your camera and mic on all the time? Or, or instead of taking, you know, pictures of the food you're about to eat, what if you just ate it? <laughs> um, you know, and th things like that. Um, so you know, th th those, those sorts of like co conversations, um, I, I think can be helpful. And then of course we can also, um, lead by example. Uh, you know, I've quite a number of nieces and nephews in my life. And I, I try to not have my phone out while they're around. So they don't think it's normal for like an adult to always be looking at their phone, um, you know, and those sorts of things. So I think we can, we can do a lot of those uh, smaller things that can make a big difference. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and this gets back to the, the addiction uh, that you referenced earlier. And it, it made me think of uh, early in my marketing career, I, I had gambling clients and I'll tell you the education that I got of, you know, and, and like you said, everything is being mimicked on our phone, the, the colors, the tones, that there is a specific key and tone that are naturally pleasing to our brain. And that's being used in notifications and sounds and feedback. And it, one of the other things the gambling industry does, especially sports books, is you know, there, there's an upcoming football game. Half the writers will write an article about why this team's going to win. The other half will write an article about why the other team's going to win. It's not that they actually have a vested interest or think a certain way or have an opinion. It's just literally by chance, this guy has to write about that team and they're going to win. Because as was explained to me, we, we just want people to read what they want to read. And that and it, that gives them the motivation to gamble more. And, and, but I see the same thing happening in news media where in the same publication, two different articles taking two sides of an issue and they're benefiting from both sides seeing what they want to see. And so, so much of that just seeps into our culture. That's a, that's fascinating about, um, the sports writers and yeah i think you're right there's an analogy of um in i guess not non-sports news as well you know what i what i tell folks is we've we, we've trained to like you know they're listening to the other side or both sides is um just because first of all there's more than two sides to to anything but beyond that just because there's another side doesn't mean they necessarily have a compelling argument um so you know of course listen out hear people out absolutely but we, we shouldn't necessarily treat all like they are compelling some have evidence you know some don't some have made conclusions off of that evidence that are uh, sound some are not um, and i think your sports analogy is a perfect example of, you know what, one of those articles is correct one is wrong in that sense or will be, you know, be proven <laughs> such right <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly uh but the motivation is to get people to spend more 
and that's what just it, it it's not based on anything other than someone's opinion and honestly that's why I stopped watching sports talk because I realized this is manufactured chaos is what it is uh and we're not going anywhere <laughs> so it was one of the things in my media diet that I just you know I it's I've got to cut that and uh <laughs> one of the best things I ever did <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah sometimes you know so, sometimes uh you know looking for um credible news is is very important but sometimes cutting things out of your media diet is, is equally in, important as well um and I you know you're, you're talking about sport sports talk radio but I think Social media is a good one to, to cut out. I mean, a lot of what you're doing on there, I don't think is necessarily useful or, or productive. Um, not everything has to be useful or productive. We all have guilty pleasures. We opened up talking about pro wrestling, um, you know, to, to be <laughs> clear. Um, but, uh, you know, 24-7 mindless entertainment is not good for you for a, a multitude of reasons. So just considering what you can cut out and what you feel okay cutting out can be an important step as well to um, undoing some of the fake news problem. And similarly, I always emphasize this in the book as well. I have a solutions guide at the end um, to take quality over quantity. It's better to take less news content and analyze it more in depth than it is to read and share every headline you come across. Um, so that's a lot, a lot better for your news diet as well is to really get to know the article and its evidence or the broadcasts and its evidence as opposed to just liking and sharing everything. Oh, yeah. And I, that's one thing I loved about the end of the book is you put in practical steps, and I want to get to that. But one of the first, before I get to that, I love what you said, it, it, focus on the quality of your news rather than the quantity. And very similar to the sports talk example, uh, the infotainment or the, uh, I, I was wondering how far I'd have to get into your book before I saw a Neil Postman quote. Uh, <laughs> and, and and I wasn't disappointed uh, but how news has turned into entertainment. And, and you make a, a great chapter of developing where, you know, we get stuff like O'Reilly, we get stuff like Oberman, where it's not news, it's, it's entertainment, but using the news as a backdrop. And what is, what are we actually learning from this? And I, you know, I think that was a very important thing. And and like you said, it's one of those things, if you're going to cut something out, cut out the infotainment. Yeah, they, uh, you know, in after the 1996, uh, Congress passed the, the Telecommunications Act, and, and now it, it got rid of the limits on how many media outlets you could be owned in a particular market. And we went from about 50 corporations controlling our news media down to six. And today there are mergers. We might end up with four, believe it or not. Um, but but um these were, you know, monopolizing corporations and, and they wanted to maximize revenue. And so they cut what they saw as pointless expenses. You know, first it was overseas bureaus. Then it was journalists who were in smaller markets. Um, they cut weekend staff. So I always like to say, if you have if something big happen in your small town on the weekends, like nobody's going to cover it. And because of the 24 hour, the advent of 24 hour news, right, with CNN in the 80s and then MSNBC and, and Fox there after the 90s. Uh, they had to uh, fill time. And so they decided to fill time with analyzing the news. Um, they really, you can tell in the beginning, they really weren't sure what analyzing the news meant. Um, but they got a uh, sort of a inspiration from an unlikely place, which was what we used to call fake news, which was satire news, um, <laughs> like the Daily Show and stuff like that. And, you know, the Daily Show cut its teeth on, we're going to make fun of how... Um, hyper-partisan and ignorant people are in, in news media, uh, particularly conservatives. They lampooned Republicans and conservatives, um, which is funny. He, you know, John Stewart would tell you that he was doing that to hopefully move the industry to um, reform itself. Instead, the industry looked at what he was doing and said, oh, <laughs> that's, a that. yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. And so Fox... <laughs> And so Fox started lampooning Democrats, um, you know, the same way that John Stewart was doing. MSNBC started lampooning Fox the way that Fox was lampooning Democrats. And, you know, it, it erupted into this Ultimo Keith Olbermann, Bill O'Reilly personality war where you tuned in to watch them like insult or blow up the other side, which, again, maybe it's cathartic for some Tuesday or something, but it's not any news. And these are not important people in your life. Um, and these, uh, this same format has persisted with, you know, the resistant liberals of Rachel Maddow and, and Don Lemon and 
um, what's his name? His brother's the the governor, uh, Cuomo, um, on oh, yeah. CNN. They they do that as well. And of course, on Fox, you have it with Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, and the the sort of um, they posit themselves like the liberal tr- or li- liberty uh, loving Trump supporters. Um, but again, there's no news in any of that. And and worse, it, I can you know, and I point to this in the book. You can point to numerous examples where they flat out either got things wrong or have. Uh, lied to the public. Um, you know, Hannity openly works with the Trump administration to take Trump lies and, and present them as news. Um, Rachel Maddow was responsible for a lot of the excesses in reporting for Russiagate that turned out to be false. So you know, not only are you not getting news, you're getting you know false information as, as you're watching this stuff as well. Probably one of the more things that has frustrated me most about the evolution of television news is let's have five people on for three minutes and let them argue over each other. And and honestly, at the end of that, I'm like, what was even the purpose? <laughs> I didn't learn a thing. <laughs> they just argued. They demanded apologies for cutting each other off. And it, it was just really, this is what the medium has become. Uh, and, and total fulfillment of what Neil Postman said would happen to the news media. Uh, and again, yeah, it just becomes very similar to the WWE style yelling in the microphone about the opponent. And then we cut to the match. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know a, a great point there as well. Um, you know, you try on like CNN and they have like, and this is no joke, 10 people plus two hosts. There's like 12 people on the stage and you know they have to cut to commercial in six minutes and all right, let's talk about poverty in America. And it's like six minutes for poverty in America is insane alone. But have like you know, twelve people comment on it. You know, I've been in news studio. I don't get invited into news studios as much now that I've written two books on the news industry. But um, when I used to go into these news studios, um, you know, they're they they try to manufacture it as much as possible. You know, here's the three topics we're going to talk about in this you know three minute segments. And so you're the pressure is put on you to overly simplify or dumb things down into 30 second sound bites, which really doesn't serve the public very well. That's why I like podcasting. I think podcaster myself and, and the work the podcasters are doing, you know, they try the best. And I think a lot of them do a great job of saying, this is a serious issue or this is a serious person or this is a serious group. I'm going to give them, you know, a serious amount of time to, to analyze or discuss this. And that just simply doesn't exist in, um, you know, television news formats. No, and I think podcasts have probably been one of the most revolutionary forms of media in the past few years. I Just last week, uh, we listened to a podcast from NPR about the history of bananas, and it was fascinating about an industrialist who went down to Costa Rica, became a, you know, monopolized everything because he traded uh, free non-taxable land but then also what he did in essentially enslaving people, he brought bananas into the U.S. at cut rate prices that no other uh, you know, food distributor or fruit distributor could compete with. And that's how we got bananas. But it was an hour long podcast where you could never in a traditional commercially driven news media tell that story with the implications and the social effects that came after it. And so I, I love podcasts now and how they're able to hit these very niche subjects and teach us really more in depth than we'll ever get from a commercially centered enterprise. Yeah, I completely agree. They, uh, you know, television news, their, their excuse was always, well, people don't like to pay attention very long, so we have to do it short. But But podcasts are blowing that excuse out of the water. And like you said, I happen to also be very interested in the history of bananas. I've read a couple of good books on that. Um, but you know, that's, that's a topic they would never cover. They would think like, there's no way people are going to be interested in, in bananas, but you know, there you go. You have people tuning in for an hour or whatever, um, to hear about it. So I, I, I think that, um, that's why I said earlier that I'm not, I'm not totally 100% doubtful. I think there are options and avenues for us to, um, really reestablish the centrality of journalism to our democracy and strengthen it. Um, but we do have to kind of shake off some of these old ways of viewing the world, um, you know, assuming that like people aren't interested in, in content or people are too stupid or the other side is lost. Um, I think we need to, to, to re-engineer how we think about uh, news information and our fellow citizenry. Oh, absolutely. I, I deal with this a lot in online marketing, but also because I do a lot in online education. More and more education providers, when they ask me for training videos, 
they're now saying, okay, the training video needs to be four minutes or less. And two years ago, it was six minutes or less. And I keep pushing back on that. And they're saying, well, our, our data shows that people are really aren't interested beyond four minutes. My put response to that, I, I just want to come back and say, well, maybe you're not giving them good information <laughs> because you look at the podcasts that are at the top and these are hour long in depth and people are listening to the entire episode. They're good stories. They're relevant. They're interesting. What people don't want is the same old boring manufactured content and they're going to bail on it. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, we see this and I'm sure you see this in your marketing studies that, that people can can tell when they're being talked down to or treated like children and they, they tend not to like it. And I think podcasts, you know, you, you kind of enter into listening to a conversation where people are talking to each other as equals, where we watch a lot of like news content. A lot of these personalities act like authorities on the subject when they're not, and they talk to you like you're ignorant of the subject when you're not. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's one of the keys of the podcast is when you feel like you could participate, then you know it's a good podcast. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Because it, it, there's no pretense. It's we're learning just like you are. Here's what we found out. I want to cover some of the parts of your toolkit that you give at the end of the book uh, as we wrap up here. And, and one of them you brought up already about, do I want to be uh, an informed user or a disseminator? I thought that was such a first place to start is stop sharing. That was a great place to start. <laughs> yeah, I thought, you know, we, again, this goes back to the conversation about how we need to reestablish the purpose of news is for a democracy that we really think about why we're reading the news um, in the first place. If you're reading the news because you want to be more informed and help your democracy, let's do it the right way. If you're simply looking at the headline because you want to share it, then you're more like you're better um, described as a fake news disseminator. So I think you need to make a decision about what you want to be and what you want to do. I think that's powerful because if people would realize that you're part of the problem, <laughs> if you're passing this on, that I think the, the words you use, the fake news disseminator, that places the impetus now on the individual that if you disagree with fake news, look at yourself first. We've fallen into this sensibility of, you know, blame the Democrat, blame the Republican, blame the conservative outlet, blame the liberal outlet. You know, there, there's a lot of blame to go around everywhere, including for ourselves. You know, we, we read this stuff, we share this stuff, we talk about this stuff. Um, and that's one place you can start. You may never be able to control Trump's Twitter feed, but you can control yourself. Great, great point. Uh, the second thing was, uh, does this article cause me to react or investigate? I love that. Love that. Uh, that gets back to the, the article with my daughter. And that was the point of contention there that we learned from that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we, and sometimes when we react, we react to what we think we read versus what we actually read. Um, and, you know, these headlines are really good at this. They, they are constructed in a way that makes you think something, but they might not even actually say it. Um, you know, sometimes like they'll say like a, a researcher in a new paper has said X, Y, and Z. And you're like, who would publish that? And you realize it's not published. A researcher just wrote a paper. You know, but, you know so th those sort of things are, are, are the way headlines can, can um, do that kind of stuff. And so it's much better to, I argue, to rather than react, either mad or happy or supportive, investigate. What is in this actual article? What are they saying? What's in here? Well, a point on investigation, and, and you, you alluded to this, and I, I just read about it the other day, is the rabbit hole of citations that so many times, and I think the other day, the article I read about was when, uh, I think it was the governor of Michigan said that uh, evidence shows that masks stop 70% or, or it was something like that. Um, stop 70% of infections. And that was cited by somebody else who cited by somebody else and cited by somebody else. And ultimately, there's no study. It's just something. And, and being in marketing, there are many times I try to find these facts and figures to share when I'm teaching. And I'll start this rabbit hole and ultimately come around that there's just this circular evidence that never points to anything specific but it's been repeated so many times, it's now just an accepted stat. Yeah, absolutely true. I, I can't tell you how many times, especially when I was researching this book, where I would hear a story. That's why I, just because it has a citation doesn't mean you should believe it. You really need to investigate the citation itself. Absolutely. I'm amazed at uh, how much that happens. And uh, 
it, 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 I'm, it's sometimes you get a bunch of 404 pages of something that used to be there and not know there anymore. <laughs> The third part of the third one was self-reflection of why did this appeal to me? That's a a very personal uh, aspect to this that was a surprise to me, but yet it makes so much sense to include that. Yeah, we should, you know, reflect. There, there's um, trillions, if not multi-trillions of uh, information or content out there. Why, why this particular piece? Was it your Google search? Was it your social media feed? Was it a website you chose to go to because you like this outlet? You know, what is it that drew your attention? Was it the image? All these things can be quite revealing um, in your own bias as to why you're reading the content you are and ignoring the other content. Well, I find it also interesting to, that question immediately what made you think of is uh, doing a presentation and sharing with them about the sponsored news at the bottom of the pages and, and explaining what native advertising is and showing him examples of these sponsored links. And, and I said, yes, they're meant to be sexualized. They're meant to be over the top. And why do they appeal to you? Why are you clicking on it? Be honest. And the more you click on them, the more you're going to see that. And they were surprised to find that out. But and that's where my mind went on that one is it takes a little bit of self honesty here about why, why am I seeing this? Well, it could be because of your previous behavior. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, your, your likes and dislikes play a major role in that. And then, you know, to go into like native advertising, um, you know, so, some of that stuff is after just innate abilities, like s- sexual desires and stuff like that. So the imagery tries to to um, draw a reaction to those things as well. Yeah, I think we could spend a whole show on on sponsored ads that look like news. That uh, <laughs> nothing drives me nuts more than that uh, <laughs> to see that in, in in stories. It's a major industry. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and then I'll wrap up with the last one, which was uh, who is the publisher uh, being a, a really a, a foundational question? Yeah, um, you know, we spend so much time online and we talk about this uh, today. We talked about wasting time. Um, you know, who is the publisher? Who is the author of the piece um, as well as what outlet published it can be really important questions. Because I, for one, uh, really value credibility. I understand that people make mistakes. I don't think if you make one mistake in reporting, you're, you're wrong all the time. But if you have a known pattern of publishing false or misleading content, or if you're an author who's known to write or broadcast misleading or false content, um, I take what you say with a grain of salt. You've sort of broken that credibility um, with me. And so I think developing those kind of relationships uh, with news outlets and journalists is really important for helping you kind of decide what's worth your time and what's not. Great, great stuff. Nolan, I got to tell you, this is uh, this has been a great uh, experience listening to you. Uh, I'd, I'd love to do another hour sometime because I think we could easily fill it up, uh, maybe even breaking down some of these things even more. Um, but how can people find your book? Uh, how can they follow you and hear more about fake news and your studies of it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, my book, you can buy a copy at ucpress.edu. Um, that's University of California Press. Um, I'm also the host of the Along the Line podcast at youtube.com slash along the line. Um, and then you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at Nolan underscore Higdon. And you can follow my work there and, and publications. And I, I agree, this has been a great conversation. I ho- hope to come back on the show again and Maybe we'll uh, try and work on um, chronicling the history of pro wrestling or something. That sounds good. I think we could do a few shows there. (laughs) That sounds good, Nolan. Hey, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation, and I look forward to more. Thank you. All right. Thank you, listener, for tuning in to the Endless Coffee Cup podcast. I hope this is one that's uh, been fascinating to you. And uh, please let me know if you'd like to hear more on this content. Uh, It's important to me, and uh, I hope it is important to you as well. Make sure you send this along to someone that you know that could use this kind of information. So thanks again, Nolan. Thank you for joining me. Have a great week, everyone. 